Let's turn our attention to the scriptures now as they're recorded for us in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, the final book in the New Testament. Revelation chapter 2, I'm going to be getting the reading at verse 8 and going through verse 11. And if you are able, I'd ask that you would stand as God's word is read. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Amen. Please be seated. Lord, these words were delivered many, many years ago to a, a church a long ways away. And yet, Lord, these words are here for us so that we might benefit. And so I pray, Lord, that in these moments we might understand the application that you would have from this text to our hearts and to our lives. Bless us as we consider your truth now. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Many of you here know in November of 2014, I had the privilege of going with a couple of other folks from our denomination. Uh, I, we were able to go to Hungary and Romania and the Ukraine and to be able to observe the work of the Lord in those places and participate with them in many activities. All three of those countries were former Iron Curtain countries. And while there for that week or 10 days or whatever it was, I met with a lot of different groups of Christians in those three countries. And we gathered freely. We gathered in their church buildings. We gathered in open air meetings in a field. We had worship together in a posh Hilton Hotel ballroom. We had worship together standing in a, a, a grassy area outside of a tavern on Saturday night. We had worship in public schools. It was an amazing thing to be able to worship with God's people there in those places and to realize it had just been a couple decades before when none of that would have been allowed by the communist government. And in fact, anybody who had tried to do any of those gatherings would have been rounded up and severely dealt with. Where we were staying in the city of Budapest, right down the street from us was a former secret police detention facility. Now, if you can believe it, a tourist trap. I didn't go but I was told by others who had been there that it was very eye-opening in terms of what was done during those communist years to people of Christian faith. It was a reminder to me that we here don't really know what it's like to live under severe persecution 
and I mean severe. But I was also reminded that persecution is not something we just read about in the history books. That persecution is real. And it affects real people, and I heard some of their stories. That persecution is going on even right now, even as we are sitting here this very moment. Our brothers and sisters in Christ and other parts of the world are being persecuted simply because they are Christian. It's still happening today. People are still literally suffering, literally dying for their faith. In the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, we have a series of seven letters, seven messages given by Jesus through the Apostle John to seven different churches. And we talked last week as we introduced this series about the fact that these were historic churches. These are factual churches. And these letters were directed specifically to them, and yet they were included in our scriptures. And at the end of each one it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That means us. And that also means all individuals a part of that who are part of the church of Jesus Christ. So it's directed to every single one of us, to our church today as well as to the specific churches. Last week we looked at the first of them, the church at Ephesus, and we saw that they were a church that was doing all sorts of wonderful things. They were busy and they were active and they were orthodox and they were all the rest but they'd lost something along the way. They had lost the love that they had for God and for others. Now today we look at the second of these letters written to the church in Smyrna. Smyrna was the epitome of a suffering, persecuted church. There are absolutely in this letter no condemnations for them as there are for some of the others. Only commendations and encouragement and hope from Jesus. Let's be honest, most of us here cannot really relate to the church in Smyrna. We can't really know experientially what it was that they were going through what we often call persecution, though it may be difficult for us to bear in our society, pales in comparison with the persecution that was happening in Smyrna. Smyrna was a seaside town. It was known for its incredible beauty. It was called the Ornament of Asia. Beautiful town by the seashore. In Smyrna was the regional temple for the worship of Caesar. The Romans were looking to put up a temple to worship Caesar in that area of Asia Minor, and they looked at all the other cities, and they decided to put it in Smyrna because it was so beautiful. That means everybody in the territory, when it came time to at least once a year affirm their allegiance to Caesar, would come where to do that? Smyrna. Smyrna also had a number of pagan temples all on the outskirts of every kind you could imagine. Because everybody wanted to be in Smyrna. It was so beautiful there. One author said, to live in Smyrna meant you were in a hotbed of Caesar worship and pagan sacrifice. And then from the letter that we read in, in, in Revelation, we see there was another group there, and that is those who, according to the letter, were claiming to be Jews, who were what Jesus calls a synagogue of Satan. So this is, this is where the Christians were. They were in this beautiful town, the center of emperor worship, where you were required to give allegiance to the emperor, and if you didn't, 
There would be very harsh consequences. They lived in an area where there were temples of all other deities and all other religions. They lived in a place where apparently those in this so-called synagogue of Satan were oppressing and harming them. In the middle of all of that is this small band of faithful Christians. Did you notice the words that were used in these few verses to describe their plight? This is just from this short letter. Afflictions, poverty, slander, suffering, imprisonment, persecution, death. That's quite a list. That's what the church at Smyrna was dealing with solely because they were the church of Jesus Christ there. And then Jesus really, in one sense, doesn't help them much, I suppose, when he says, what you are about to suffer. Did you notice that when we read? This is not a letter where Jesus says, okay, I see what you're going through now. I'm stopping it right now. No, he says, what you are about to suffer. It's going to continue. Those of you who have done any study or research into the history of the Christian church, <coughs> excuse me, especially in the first century or so, know the name Polycarp. Polycarp was one of the great leaders of the early church movement, and for many years he served as the bishop of the church in Smyrna. And there was a wave of persecution that came. This was after this letter had been written from uh, Jesus. And the mob demanded Polycarp be killed. And the Roman officials actually gave him several opportunities to recant his faith. And when he was given one final chance to save his own life, he was quoted as saying this, For 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? The soldiers were preparing to nail him to the stake to be burned alive. He refused the nails, saying, Leave me as I am, for he who grants me to endure the fire will enable me also to remain on the pyre unmoved without the security you desire from your nails. And the fire was lit. Polycarp was burned to death. And as the flames consumed him, he was heard to pray, I thank you, O Lord, that you have deemed me worthy this day and this hour to take up the cross of Christ with many witnesses. I have trouble relating to that. What an incredible faith. What an incredible testing of faith. He was the bishop of Smyrna. Gives you some ideas to what it was like to be a Christian there. Now, what does Jesus have to say to these people in this circumstance? What hope does he give them? Well, he does give them hope. And that hope is the same hope that he gives to us no matter what the degree of opposition or difficulty we might experience because of the cause of Christ. First thing he says is that he knows. I know, he says. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. You know, when tough times come, one of the things that often happens to us, I think, is we're tempted to think, has, has God forgotten me? Does he really know? Does he see? It's a comfort to know that he does. He knows. Sometimes when we get to that place, prayer becomes an exercise. We think we have to remind God. Oh God, here I am. Remember me? I'm having trouble here. He says, I know. I know your afflictions. He sees, he knows, he understands. If you ever need a reminder of that, just turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139 should be worn out in your scriptures. 
It says, where shall I go from your presence? If I go all the way over here, you're there. If I go there, you're there. You're wherever I go. You are with me. You know. Please read Psalm 139 and have that little uh, notation in your brain for whenever you wonder whether God knows. The question could be asked, well, if he knows, why doesn't he do something to fix it? Wow, there's a sermon for another day. Maybe a series of them. But what I will say in a partial answer to that question is that When we read the New Testament, we discover that identifying with Christ means to share in his sufferings. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And how often I hear people in the Christian church say, I'd like to be more like Christ. And I'm tempted to say, oh, really? What do you mean by that? Paul says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his sufferings. Polycarp apparently felt he was blessed to be able to share, to be counted worthy to share in the sufferings of Christ. So first off, God knows. He knows. The second thing of hope that he gives us is that Sufferings, persecutions have a shelf life. They're not forever. He says here, the unique thing, he says, uh, we'll put some of you in prison and and we'll suffer persecution for ten days. That's sort of an enigmatic phrase. We're not sure exactly what he means. I don't think he really means, you know, 240 specific hours. I think... What he means is saying that, to use my favorite expression I learned from comedian Mark Lowry, it came to pass. It came to pass. Sufferings have a shelf life. Sufferings and persecution do not extend forever. Polycarp's suffering and persecution came to an end, and now he's got eternity you know, he, he would make that exchange. And that there's a place that awaits where there are no more tears or crying or pain or evil or satanic opposition. Sufferings have a, this life, like everything else in this world, are transient. And then the other hope that Jesus gives is that the end reward is worth it. To him who overcomes... He will receive the victor's crown and not hurt by the second death. Critics of Christianity say, ah, that's just pie in the sky by and by. I can't wait for that pie. How about you? There is nothing wrong with understanding that because of Jesus Christ, because when this world ends, there's a beautiful one waiting for us, one that we can't even imagine. It's so wonderful. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. Not worth comparing. Paul knew a little bit about persecution and suffering when he wrote that. So, That's our hope. That's the good news. But Jesus says something else in this letter. He answers the question, well, what do you do when you find yourself in these circumstances? What do we do when we find ourselves persecuted for our faith? Two things he says. First, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Someday... If you want a little exercise to do, maybe this Tuesday if the storm comes they're talking about and you're shut up at home and you need got some time, take out a Bible and maybe a concordance, whether it's online or somewhere, and type in fear not or do not be afraid, depending upon your version of the Bible. And just trace through the scriptures how 
often God says that to all sorts of people in all sorts of circumstances. Fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. 2 Timothy 1.7, Paul says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. In Mark 10, Jesus said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Fear not. The Bible is full of promises, and I tell people, you ought to have a handful of them, either written out that you carry around with you, or memorized so that when you go through any situation and you're tempted to fear, you can pull those promises out and have them right here. Because we need to be reminded of them all the time. We don't talk about Scripture memorization much anymore. But boy, it's wonderful to have those that resource if you have memorized some of those promises. Lo, I am with you always to the ends of the earth. I will never leave you or forsake you. Greater is he who is in me than who is in the world. Promises like that that are true because of the one who made them. So don't be afraid. And the second thing he says is be faithful. Be faithful. Throughout the Bible, we are called upon as God's people to be steadfast, and persevering. Perseverance is one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's one of the things that Paul says, God, Holy Spirit produces in us. Walking away and compromise are not options. God says be faithful. And he says here, the one who is victorious. That's the expectation of Jesus. We are to be victors and not victims. He who is victorious. Well, there's a lot in this little passage, isn't there? And again, we're tempted perhaps to say, well, I sure hope the folks at Smyrna got great hope from that. Or maybe this is the thing I would share with somebody in another culture where there's tribal warfare or an Islamic country or something of the sort where that kind of thing is happening. But the message is for us too. First of all, we don't have any guarantee that we will never have to experience such things. Secondly, there is persecution in our day and age. It takes a different form. Kind of hard to put it side by side and weigh it, but nevertheless, there are some of you here who have had things happen to you specifically because you were a Christian. I think we can read a letter like this from Jesus and remember those wonderful truths that he knows that the sufferings have a shelf life and the end reward will certainly be worth it. And he asks us simply not to be afraid, but to be faithful. We don't know what the future is going to hold. Knowing this can help us do a couple of things. One is, can help us be prepared for when and if that happens to us. But secondly, it also gives us a template. If you want to know how to pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, This is what you pray for. This is how we can support and encourage and bring God's grace in their lives. So don't dismiss this little letter as being irrelevant. There is much in here we need to understand and apply in our lives. And as the scripture says, he who has an ear, let him hear, let her hear, what the Spirit says. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I never quite know whether it's right to thank you that we are not living in Smyrna or thinking that maybe if we did live in Smyrna we would be better off somehow spiritually. I don't know. But Lord, we do know that there are those who live in Smyrna today, figuratively so, 
And we know that we have no guarantee that we will not also have to suffer for the cause of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that you would be close and comforting and encouraging and that we would remember that you know and that whatever persecution we have won't last, that the final result, the reward of our faithfulness is astounding, and that we need not be afraid, but with your help, remain faithful. Guide us in that end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.